Jesus said there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come to be, even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us is a great chasm, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. And he said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, they should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. this morning about the idea of ignorance as it applies to our gospel reading today. The word ignorance, of course, refers to the condition of being uninformed or lacking knowledge. For example, the story is told of a man who loved old books, and one day he ran into an acquaintance of his who had just thrown away a Bible that had been stored up in the attic of his family home for generations. It was old and dusty, and, and I just couldn't read it, complained the man. Somebody named Guten something had printed it. <laughs> Gutenberg, the book lover responded in horror. That, that Bible was one of the first books ever printed. Back in 1978, a copy sold for over $2 million, and today experts estimate that a complete copy could fetch upwards of $35 million at auction. His friend, however, was unimpressed. Nah. Mine wouldn't have brought even a dollar. Somebody had scribbled all over it in German, some, some fellow named Martin Luther. <laughs> ignorance. Sometimes, of course, ignorance is bliss, as they say. In other words, if you don't know about something, it won't bother you. Although the fellow who threw away that Bible probably felt sick once he realized what it was worth, but certainly not before. Other times, however, ignorance can be downright dangerous. An older gentleman was driving home from work one afternoon when all of a sudden his cell phone rang. It was his wife, and she was in a panic. Honey, she said, be careful coming home. I just saw on TV that some maniac is driving the wrong way on the interstate. And the husband replied, just one? Why, there must be hundreds of them from what I can see. <laughs> ignorance. The condition of being uninformed or lacking knowledge. But there's another word related to the noun, ignorance. In fact, it comes from the very same root word, and it's the verb, ignore. Originally, it too simply referred to being uninformed or lacking in knowledge. In a sense, you might say the, the act of being ignorant. But over time, as is the case for many words, it evolved in meaning. And by the 1800s, it now meant to refuse to take notice of or deliberately pay no attention to. On the one hand, you or I could be ignorant or lacking in knowledge about something simply because we had never learned about it or experienced it in our daily lives. For example, having grown up here on the East Coast and in the suburbs, I was completely ignorant about farm and rural living when I first arrived at my seminary internship in Gibsonburg, Ohio. In other words, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't because I had somehow chosen not to know anything about agriculture. It just simply wasn't a part of my upbringing and life experience at that point. 
But on the other hand, and in other instances, it could, I could be ignorant about something else because I had chosen not to know. That my ignorance was actually due to intentionally ignoring something. I can't tell you how many times over the years that Jeanette has confronted me about ignoring something. Maybe I left a pair of shoes in the middle of the room where I took them off. And she'll say to me, didn't you see your shoes sitting there in the middle of the floor? And I would say, of course I did. I stepped over them when I walked by, didn't I? <laughs> That's what we mean by the word ignore. I consciously chose to be ignorant about something, namely the fact that my shoes didn't belong there in the middle of the floor, and I should probably pick them up and put them away in my closet. And so there's a kind of passive ignorance, if you will, where it's not really our fault, we just haven't had a chance to learn something yet. But then there's also active ignorance as well, where we deliberately and intentionally choose to ignore something, oftentimes because it's either inconvenient or uncomfortable. Well, it's that latter sense of the word that I want to talk with you about this morning. The intentional and deliberate ignorance that results from our actively choosing to ignore. Or as Paul Rauschenbusch once called it, ignore hence. You see, the rich man in today's parable was not merely guilty of any run-of-the-mill ignorance or simply not knowing about the poor man Lazarus who laid there at his gate. How could he be? Lazarus was there every day, week in and week out. How could the rich man not see or be aware of him? Unless, of course, he chose not to see or be aware of him. In other words, to ignore him. And so the parable is pretty straightforward and easily understandable, isn't it? And the consequence of the rich man's ignorance are pretty harsh, aren't they? The consequences. In death, as we hear, there's this huge reversal of fortunes. The rich man who dressed in fine linen and feasted sumptuously now, now is tormented and in agony by the flames of Hades. While the poor man, Lazarus, who was covered with sores that the, that the rich man's dogs would come and lick, and who longed to even eat the scraps that fell from the rich man's table, has now been carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. A great chasm exists between them. But really, no different from the one that had existed between them in this life, however, when the rich man consciously chose to ignore Lazarus. <coughs> Only now, according to the parable, it's too late to do anything about it. And the implication of Jesus' story, of course, is that the time to bridge that gap was in this life, not the next. Ignore, yes. It happens all the time. The, the things and the people we choose not to see, again, because it's either inconvenient makes us uncomfortable, or both. Just yesterday, in fact, I read an article entitled 17 Ridiculously Spoiled Things People Said That Made My, made my Jaw Drop. And I kid you not, these take the attitude of the rich man in today's gospel to a, to a whole new level. A whole new level of ignoring and at the same time feeling and acting superior to those less fortunate than themselves. Here's just a few of them. A seventh grade student of mine was complaining because her mom's SUV was being repaired and said, now I have to ride in a normal car, and I hate it. <laughs> I live in Bo Boca Raton, said someone else, and I once saw a 10-year-old throw a fit because her mom was buying her Gucci sunglasses and she wanted Versace ones. My four-year-old was wearing her first set of earrings and one of her preschool classmates told her mom that she liked them, and the mom replied, they're probably not real gold, and that's all that matters. Another one said, I overheard a dude trying to explain to his friends that the, the amount of money his dad had just given him wasn't a, a big deal. And they kept saying that it was a big deal. So finally he said, look, it's not that much. It's less than it costs him to fuel his jet. <laughs> I work in retail, said someone else, and one day I was ringing up a group of teenage girls. I greeted them and was met with silence, followed by laughter. When I finished, I said, have a good day, and again was ignored. And as they left, one said, I'm so glad my parents are lawyers and I don't have to be like her, meaning the clerk. And finally, someone said, I go to a school in a rich area and there's a kid in my class who said, how do poor people exist? Like, just work harder. Just work harder. How many times have people consciously ignored or dismissed the poor and less fortunate around them with exactly that kind of attitude? 
How many times have you done it? I know I certainly have on occasion. Why can't they just get their act together? The, the old, I've done it, why can't they? Attitude. But here's the thing. If you've worked hard to get where you're at and to enjoy the lifestyle you've attained, wonderful. I'm very happy for you. But I would venture to guess, I'd be willing to bet that those of us who have enjoyed some professional or financial success in life didn't get there all by ourselves. Most of us had the benefit of supportive parents, quality schools, and encouraging mentors. Or maybe even a little bit of luck. John D. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil, and the richest man in the world in his day, once gave the secret to his own success. Number one, go to work early. Number two, stay late. Number three, find oil. <laughs> 45 years ago, Marty Gibson, the daughter of the Pope's founding pastor and I, both went out to Columbus, Ohio to attend Capital University. And both of us took the same freshman biology course. A few weeks later, Pastor Allen and his wife Lois were visiting with my parents and proudly shared that Marty had gotten 100 on the very first exam, one of only two perfect scores in that introductory class of well over 100 students. To which my parents proudly shared with them that I had gotten the other perfect score. My point here is simply this, both Marty and I were good students and had worked hard for those grades, but among other things, we were also, I would argue, the products of an excellent school system here in Freehold Township that had prepared us to go on to succeed in college and then in life. Not to mention that we both had parents who encouraged and supported us. And the simple reality is that not everyone else has benefited from such a good start as we have. Now you've probably all heard the old saying, there's nothing new under the sun. Quick aside, did you know that's from the Bible? You can look it up, Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9. Well, it is true. There really is nothing new under the sun. The income back gap and inequality that we're experiencing today also existed when the prophet Amos in our first reading warned those who lie on beds of ivory and anoint themselves with the finest oils and simultaneously ignore the plight of the poor would be the first to go into exile when the northern kingdom of Israel fell. And when the writer of 1 Timothy warned that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil and instead encouraged the rich of his day to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share. And of course, when Jesus himself told the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. I just read recently that there isn't a single county, not a single one in the entire United States where someone making a minimum wage can afford to rent a two-bedroom apartment. In Atlanta, for example, the wage needed to rent a two-bedroom apartment is $21.27 an hour, and yet Georgia's minimum wage is a meager $5.15 an hour. And a woman in Boston, and a, and a tenant in Boston, would have to work 141 hours a week earning minimum wage to afford that same two-bedroom apartment. And then I also saw recently a YouTube video featuring Mike Huckabee, the former governor of Arkansas, and two-time presidential candidate. He is just about highly proud of the fact that he was the very first one in his family to get a college education. Not only that, but he worked to pay his own way through school and even graduated in a little over two years instead of four. No small accomplishment to be sure. But the whole point of his little talk was to poke fun at the current presidential candidates who are proposing that we find a way to forgive the crushing student debt that is hindering and holding back so many of our young people today. Now, Mike Huckabee and I are about the same age. He's just a year older. When I attended the aforementioned Capital University in 1974, tuition, room, and board was approximately $3,000 a year. Pricey for its time. Today, however, I just checked. It's now $48,764 a year. And I don't know how much Wachita Baptist Huckabee's alma mater ran back in those days, but today it's $38,879 a year, about $10,000 less than capital. And so we could probably safely assume there was also less than capital back in 1974 as well. But let's do the math. In order to work myself through capital back in 1974, when the minimum wage here in New Jersey was $2.45 an hour, as I recall, I would 
would have had to work 1,224 hours, or about three and a half hours a day, 365 days a year, not counting financial aid or working longer hours in the summertime. <laughs> Certainly doable. And as it turns out, I had a financial aid package worth about $1,100, leaving me with a balance of $1,900. And in the summer, I worked approximately 14 weeks for the Freehold Regional High School District doing maintenance. 40 hours a week at $2.45 an hour came to $1,372, leaving me now with a balance of $528 to be earned during the remaining 38 weeks of the year, which works out to be a little less than three hours a day, five days a week, even more doable. Today, however, even with New Jersey's $11 an hour minimum wage, I would have to work 4,433 hours a year or a little more than 12 hours a day in 365 days a year. And that's gross, not net pay. Even at Wachita Baptist today, which again costs less than capital, with Arkansas's minimum wage of $9.25 an hour, in 2019, Mike Huckabee himself would have to work 4,203 hours, or just under 12 hours a day. 365 days a year, gross, not net. And do I even have to ask when someone would go to class or study, let alone eat and sleep? Needless to say, that's precisely why young people today are faced, forced to take out loans to pay for college. And so when Mike Huckabee brags about putting himself through college and then implies that, that young people today should simply follow suit, he's being disingenuous to say the least. Times are different. Young adults today are putting off home ownership sometimes even marriage, not to mention children, because they simply can't afford it, not with the burden of student loan debt that so many of them are carrying. Indulge me, one more example. Back in April, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, was testifying before Congress when Representative Katie Porter from California confronted him with the fact that one of her constituents, a full-time bank teller at a Chase bank, earning $35,000 a year, runs a $567 budget shortfall each month. She's short $567 a month, said Representative Porter. What do you suggest she do? And Diamond replied, I don't know, I'd have to think about that. And then Representative Porter pushed the issue, would you recommend she take out a J.P. Morgan Chase credit card and run a deficit? Mm -hmm. Would you recommend that she overdraft at your bank and then have to be charged overdraft fees? And all Diamond could say in each instance was, I don't know, I'd have to think about it. All this from a man who personally earns $31 million a year, by the way. Now, please don't get me wrong. And listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Being successful is not a sin. Being rich is not a sin. In fact, I'm personally very happy that Jamie Diamond and J.P. Morgan are doing so well and are very successful. After all, my, they employ my oldest daughter, Kristen, and Jeanette and I are relying on her to take care of us in our old age. <laughs> <laughs> Nor was the wealth of the rich man in Jesus' parable a sin either. The sin was the sin of ignore, hence. The ignorance that comes from ignoring of not paying attention to the poor, or in our case today, even the working poor in our midst. And so what Jesus is reminding us here with this cautionary tale of the rich man of Lazarus is that as Christians, we are simply cannot ignore the poor and less fortunate. We are called to be better than that. We are called to do better than that. As Jesus once said in Luke 12, verse 48, from everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. Amen. Please stand for the hymn of the day.